It's Tuesday, December 20th. It's up to the Justice Department now, but Congress says you should have all the evidence you need. We start here. The committee on January 6th says former President Trump should go behind bars. They believe with specificity that Donald Trump is guilty of, they listed at least four separate crimes. We'll break down the charges they examined and whether actual prosecutors will do anything with them. The nation's biggest keep out sign will stay up for at least a little while longer. It quickly became an issue of like, are we really doing this because of health reasons? Or are we doing this in the grander scheme of things? Why a deadline to end Title 42 has been extended by the Supreme Court. And Donald Trump had been embraced by the religious right, which is exactly what the Catholic Church is afraid of. Those bishops who uh, hate our work and uh, they're in league actually with, uh, with the Democrats. Now a pro-Trump priest has been defrocked. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Yesterday, as promised, the House Select Committee on January 6th convened for what is likely its final, most definitive appearance in its short existence. Their hearings have delivered drama, but more importantly, they've delivered key facts. I remember Pat saying to him something to the effect of, the rioters have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. Trump has only asked me for two things. He asked me for my vote, and he asked me to come on January 6th. And I said, I don't want to hear any other effing words coming out of your mouth, no matter what, other than orderly transition. Repeat those words to me. At the end of this road, though, the question has been, what would these committee members do with all the evidence they've collected? Would they make concrete conclusions about what did happen that day? Would they assign responsibility? And would they even tell the Department of Justice that they believed crimes had been committed here? Well, yesterday in Washington, we got our answer. And the accusations this committee leveled were against the highest ranking man in the land at the time of that attack. So let's take you to the Capitol this morning. ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl is there right now. And John, can you just break down what happened in this meeting? This was the culmination of an investigation that's been going on for a year and a half. And the final judgment of this committee, and not surprisingly, but powerfully, their judgment is that Donald Trump was singularly responsible for what happened on January 6th. President Trump lit the flame. He poured gasoline on the fire and sat by in the White House dining room for hours watching the fire burn. This committee believes that he is guilty of multiple felonies, that he is guilty of multiple crimes against the United States, not just for inciting what we all saw happen on January 6th, but for his overall effort to overturn a presidential election. So, you know, Brad, this is a criminal referral is what they're calling it to the Justice Department. The Justice Department's going to make its own decisions about whether or not to prosecute Donald Trump. I think the more important aspect here of this is that this committee, after conducting an incredibly wide-ranging and thorough investigation, uh, is saying that they believe with specificity that Donald Trump is guilty of, they listed at least four separate crimes. Yeah, let's talk about the, the charges themselves, because like you said, this is specific, and they're not just saying like, he's bad, he did bad stuff. They're saying that these are specific statutes they now believe he violated. What are they? Well, the, the first is obstruction of an official proceeding, which is a crime. You can't obstruct an official government proceeding. The proceeding in this case was the certification of the presidential election. During the speech and immediately thereafter, President Trump stated his intention to travel to the Capitol with his supporters in an effort to influence the joint session. The select committee has developed evidence indicating that President Trump did, in fact, intend to go to the Capitol on the afternoon of January 6th. That Declared evidence himself. they've outlined with some detail over the course of all their hearings. They also accused him of uh, conspiring to defraud the United States. They accused him of conspiring to make a false statement. The false statement in this case uh, were those fake slates of electors uh, that they had put together in seven of the states uh, that Trump was disputing, where they got people to come together and sign their names as if they were electors, as if Donald Trump had won those states when, when he had not. He oversaw an effort to obtain and transmit false electoral college ballots to Congress and the National Archives. So those are the, the primary statutes. One other is insurrection, which is 
a, a law that was passed in 1940, little used, but it, it, it forbids aiding and abetting in any way an insurrection against the United States. The reason why this one is especially significant is because of what it says in the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which puts a ban, this was a post-Civil War era uh, amendment, obviously, uh, but it, it bans anybody who is uh, guilty of insurrection against the United States or aiding rebellion against the United States of running for office ever again. Oh, interesting. Because I was going to say, I, I was just about to ask you what this might mean now for President Trump's campaign. Because, like, he's a current candidate for president. And while the DOJ doesn't have to do anything with what Congress says, it, like, will this hang over his campaign, essentially? Well, certainly all of the criminal investigations that he is facing uh, will, will hang over his campaign. None of them will prevent him from running. But if he is indicted, and if those indictments lead to a criminal trial in which he is convicted, he is found guilty, and if one of those charges is aiding an insurrection, there will be an argument that that triggers this clause in the 14th Amendment that he can no longer uh, be eligible uh, to be elected for high office. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. He is unfit for any office. Now, Brad, ever you know, any- we've gotten many steps ahead of ourselves here, but this trial, should it happen, uh, could be playing out against the backdrop of a presidential campaign where he, in fact, uh, is a candidate. So um, we, we are truly, truly in a way, and we, we, we've said this in the past, but this, I think, is a whole nother level. Uh, we are entering uncharted waters here. Well, and President Trump actually issued a statement saying, quote, these folks don't get it that when they come after me, the people who love freedom rally around me, end quote, which you could argue, John, is like the point of the whole investigation, right? People do indeed rally around him. That was a problem on January 6th. Uh, Who else are they now, though, referring to the DOJ? Because it's not just President Trump, right? His wasn't the only name on this list. Absolutely not. Uh, they specifically mentioned John Eastman. He's the lawyer that came up with the idea that that Mike Pence could single-handedly uh, reject electoral votes and swing the presidential election in his role, his ceremonial role, presiding over the counting of electoral votes. John Eastman, who was also involved in putting together those slates of faked electors, he's referred uh, to the Department of Justice. But the committee suggests that there are several other people who uh, they believe may have uh, conspired Inspired with Donald Trump to commit these crimes. We wanted to proceed in such a way that we could all feel certain that these were people um, where evidence exists that they engaged in criminal offenses against the country. They point out that a number of these uh, people have refused to talk to the committee, uh, have cited the, the Fifth Amendment, have defied subpoenas. Uh, they, they mention some names, um, and, but they say that it's up to the Department of Justice uh, to continue the investigation. One of the names uh, they mention is the president's uh, lead attorney through much of this, Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, we also got a response from John Eastman, who said this committee had a chance to make real changes. Instead, he said, quote, this opportunity has been squandered in favor of concocting a pretend criminal case from pretend prosecutors designed to create political advantage for the Democratic Party. This report, pretty damning, though, reminding us that when Eastman was asked for proof that the election was stolen, like he said, he took the Fifth Amendment. Uh, John Carl at the Capitol. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Brad. Next up on Start Here, border towns were expecting a new crisis until a last-minute move by the Supreme Court. We'll explain after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. 
Now that's how you start your day, people. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Big breath. Zen. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to my ranch. Packs should get along like a happy family. People mistake an excited dog for a happy dog. My German just told her, your energy is not healthy. A little more confidence, less nervous talk, better leash work. I could imagine you there, and you're kind of like my spirit guide. I feel like I'm the boss again. Yes, calm, confident. There you go. For weeks now, there's been a deadline on the books. Tomorrow, December 21st, was supposed to be the end of this immigration policy called Title 42, in which we just haven't been allowing migrants to come in and claim asylum based on pandemic concerns. The idea is you don't get processed, you don't get to make your case, you just get shuttled back across the border. At least, this policy was supposed to end tomorrow. Judges have gone back and forth about whether it can be rescinded and by whom. Well, last night, the Supreme Court announced it is putting this rollback on hold again while it considers the case. ABC's Maria Villarreal covers immigration and is currently in El Paso, Texas, along the border. Maria, I mean, how significant was this move by the court last night? You know, I think for the states and the city leaders and law enforcement, everybody involved and on the ground, I think this was a big deal for them. I mean, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning, what would this all look like if Title 42 goes away? And I think a lot of that just has to do with we've been so reliant on this policy for several years now. So I think for a lot of people on the ground, this is a big deal. But in the grander scheme of things, I'm not really sure we got a definitive answer of what immigration or immigration reform could potentially look like in the future. Yeah, because essentially the Supreme Court takes this and now they will sort of decide what they think of Title 42, and they're just kind of keeping it in place. It could be days, it could be weeks, we don't know. But, Maria, you kind of pointed out that it's become this tool, but one of the reasons it was instituted as a tool was a pandemic thing, even though so many other pandemic mandates have been lifted, just not this one. Is, is the reason this one hasn't been lifted just because it conveniently is the one that keeps more migrants out of the country? Like, that's why it's being challenged whenever the CDC tried to lift it. You know, I think that's what critics have said all along. I think that, you know, we have been covering immigration for years now, or I have, and this was definitely a very interesting play on the part of the Trump administration. You know, listen, was there a genuine concern initially about who was coming in where and what they we're bringing and COVID and all of these things, right? But as the statistics started to come in, it was very clear that the migrants that were coming across into the U.S. and they were being apprehended by Border Patrol, a very small percentage of them actually were testing positive for COVID. And so it quickly became an issue of like, are we really doing this because of health reasons or are we doing this to minimize the amount of people that are coming across into the U.S. and seeking asylum? You've seen that people coming across, they were saying maybe one person a day with COVID. So how does a judge look at that and go, oh, it's still a public health risk? But some do come across with COVID and, and no one knows exactly who comes across with COVID. I think critics will say like this was about immigration. This was never about the safety of the rest of the country when it came to their health. That all being said, it worked. I mean, it definitely was a huge tool for law enforcement, for Border Patrol especially, really for a lot of the communities along the border that uh, found relief, you know, in the last few years with Title 42 in place. Yeah, I was going to say, let's talk about next steps, because regardless of, of when it goes away, Title 42 is going to end eventually, is at least the, the, the thinking. What happens when it does? What have these communities been preparing for? These communities have been preparing as best they can for months now. There was talk about Title 42 going away back in the spring, and then this was extended and prolonged, and it gave people more time to get their stuff together. Now, whether they did or didn't is a bigger question, obviously. I mean, the city of El Paso has said that they were really hoping that the federal government would step in and would help more, um, especially when it came to sheltering, transportation, and funding, really. It's gotten to the point where the Red Cross has said, hey, listen, we're going to have to step up and potentially bring in room for 10,000 cots. The Red Cross has uh, come into El Paso 
and has brought uh, 10,000 cots to make sure that uh, we are ready. I mean, that is similar in scope to what we saw at the Houston Astrodome during um, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. You know, 10,000 cots were set up for New Orleans residents, you know, as they were fleeing uh, the hurricane. Wow, to picture that, like the Astrodome, that was for like this one-time huge generational emergency. And this plan for 10,000 cots in El Paso would just be because a lot of people are getting ready to come across the border the moment that this policy ends. All right, Maria Villarreal there in El Paso. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Brad. Amid everything that was happening in the 2020 election, it was easy to forget that Joe Biden stood to become just the second president in U.S. history who's Catholic. I know for me, my Catholic faith has helped me through the darkness as I've had to bury pieces of my soul deep in the earth. And this became, in some ways, a confusing moment for some American Catholics. After all, Biden was espousing lots of beliefs that were consistent with church teachings about public safety nets and watching out for the little guy. But he was also emphatically in favor of abortion rights, to the point where some American bishops were asking aloud whether he should even be able to receive the holy sacrament of communion. Biden says the Pope also gave him a vote of support on a controversial issue back home. He said that you should keep receiving communion. Yes. Well, this past weekend, the Vatican did take the step of chastising an American Catholic, but this was a priest, Father Frank Pavone in Texas, who has now been defrocked because he'd become too ardent in his opposition to abortion, too venomous in his disdain of people like Joe Biden, and too political for his diocese. Let's bring in someone who knows all about how the Vatican thinks and how the American Catholic Church operates. Father Tom Reese is a Jesuit priest who's also a senior analyst for Religion News Service. Father Reese, can you help me understand who this priest is in Texas and what was so bad that he would get kicked out of the priesthood? Well, Father Frank Pavon has been involved uh, in the pro-life movement for decades. Hi friends, Father Frank Pavone here, director of Priests for Life, uh, coming to you on Sunday, December 18th and bringing you my daily diary. He's had a very checkered career, uh, especially with his uh, bishops. Certain uh, bishops who uh, don't seem to like the work we do, saving babies and healing their moms and dads uh, from abortion, I'll leave it to them to explain. Uh, why they don't uh, support uh, this work, but they always persecute us, try to put obstacles in the way. Uh, One simple message for them, it won't work, okay? It won't work. The Uh, core of the problem is that Frank uh, has gotten involved in politics all the way up to his eyeballs. Uh, Priests are not supposed to get involved in partisan political campaigns. Yeah, I'm looking at his, like, Twitter profile pictures. Is him like, like, like a MAGA hat, right? <laughs> Absolutely. See this hat that I'm wearing? Trump 2024. He has a plan to drain the swamp. He was co-chair of Trump's 2020 pro-life coalition, and he was uh, an, an, on the advisory board of Catholics for Trump. Uh, All of those things are uh, uh, things that are forbidden for priests to do. There's no problem with him going out and talking about how important uh, life in the womb is or speaking about values or issues. But when it comes down to endorsing candidates, that's where the Catholic Church draws the line. I'm curious if there's an audience for this type of rhetoric, even within Catholic circles for somebody like Pavone, because I'm looking at his statement when he got defrauded. He, he compares himself to an aborted fetus. He says the only difference is that when we are aborted, he says, we continue to speak loud and clear. A, a Texas bishop named Joseph Strickland said the blasphemy, he was supporting Pavone, he said the blasphemy is that this holy priest is canceled while an evil president promotes the denial of truth. I mean, this is the sort of language that's become very normal in conservative circles. I'm wondering if it's becoming part of the rhetoric among broader Catholics, either in church or even some of their local leaders. Well, one of the sad things that we're discovering these days, uh, and a lot of public polling research has validated this, is that it is no longer religion that is influencing people's political views. It's their political views are influencing their religion. They're made up charges, you know, oh, blasphemous comments. What in the world are they talking about? Well, you see, just like they do with President Trump, you know, oh, well, you know, abuse of power. What in the world does that mean, right? What does blasphemous comments mean? His political views uh, became preeminent for him. 
not his ministry as a priest. And that's fine if you want to leave the priesthood and go be a politician. He could even run for Congress if he wants. But you can't do that as a priest. The priest is supposed to be a unifying figure in the community. But, you know, you're right when you say there is an audience for this kind of rhetoric, this kind of uh, campaigning. But I'm thrilled to be here in Miami, Florida, to officially launch one of the most important grassroots movements in American history. It's a first. Evangelicals for Trump. And... Where we see that especially is in the evangelical community. Uh, the white evangelicals are endorsing candidates like crazy. Uh, their camp ministers are campaigning. Lord, I thank you that America didn't need a preacher in the Oval Office. It did not need a professional politician in the Oval Office, but it needed a fighter and a champion for freedom. And Lord, that's exactly what we have. This was true in the black evangelical church also. But it was not true in the Catholic Church. The Catholic uh, bishops are very strict about keeping uh, priests out of politics. This has nothing to do with the Constitution. Uh, you know, you, we see uh, black ministers and white evangelical ministers running for political office. We just got one elected in Georgia. Listen, your vote is your voice. We saw a sea of God's people show up and prophesy. This is the Catholic Church being more strict on the separation of church and state than the U.S. Constitution. My last question for you is about the Vatican, like in Rome, because we've seen American bishops actually be quite conservative. We've seen them sometimes be critical, seeming, of Pope Francis, the thinking that, that maybe the current sort of Vatican administration is actually to the left of where a lot of American Catholics are at this point. Is, is that an issue where the Vatican could be sort of signaling, hey, you're going, you guys are going too conservative. You're going too hardcore here on the abortion issue. No, no, not at all. Uh, the message being sent here is to priests to be obedient to their bishops. That's okay. the message uh, here. It's not some policy signal change you're saying. No, that's, that's, been a traditional <laughs> policy for centuries. Right. I mean, the Pope himself has been very strong on abortion. He talks about it like hiring an assassin. Now, I would add this one interesting footnote to this whole story, and that is that the dicastery issued its, its uh, decision on November 7. It waited until the, the, you know, the midterm elections were over. Um. I think it wanted to make this, you know, this is a decision probably wanted to make for months, but did not want it to appear as interfering in American politics. And secondly, I think they wanted to get it over with before the 2024 election, because I don't think they wanted Pavone, uh, Frank, out there uh, campaigning with his Roman collar on. Huh. He can campaign now, but he's got to take his Roman collar off. Fascinating. All right. Uh, Tom Reese from Religion News Service. Thank you so much, Father. Good to be with you. And one last thing. It's been a tale of two sequels. If you want to live here, you have to ride. Avatar The Way of Water, the sequel to the epic 2009 feature, made $134 million in its opening weekend, a huge amount of money, and yet nowhere near what analysts say it needs. That's because reportedly Avatar The Way of Water would need to clear $2 billion just to turn a profit. Just breathe. Breathe. <sighs> The movie, which because of a merger with 21st Century Fox, is now helmed by our parent company, Disney, took several years to make. Engineers were brought in specifically how to figure out to do new types of underwater motion capture. And of course, all this was done before a pandemic, when it was expected big movies would be watched in big movie theaters. Edie Falco recently revealed she shot her scenes so long ago, she thought the movie must have already come out and flopped. <laughs> and then somebody recently said, oh, Avatar is coming out. So, oh. It hasn't come out yet. <laughs> Avatar could still make money because of overseas box offices, and it has already raked in 300 million in foreign sales. But other movies are providing a whole different playbook for the big screen. Because tonight, in this very room, a murder will be committed. 
Glass Onion is a sequel to the surprise smash hit murder mystery Knives Out. It opened Thanksgiving weekend. Like Avatar, film executives paid a fortune to get the rights to it. Like Avatar, its opening theatrical release did not smash records. But unlike Avatar, movie theaters were never the play here. Once you're dead, will we still be able to talk to you? Yeah, I'm not playing dead the whole weekend. Netflix is now the producer on the Knives Out mystery movies, and Netflix decided to only let Glass Onion play for a week in theaters, effectively just serving as a teaser for its real debut on streaming this Friday. But some analysts say this was extremely risky. By yanking it from theaters, they say, Netflix probably left a couple hundred million dollars worth of ticket sales on the table. The first movie did pretty well theatrically. The budget's not very big. It made its money back. It was profitable. They're spending all this money. Why not find a way to embark into a theatrical release? If the plan here was to make tons of money off subscribers, well, Netflix has already pumped the brakes on new money-making ventures like ads. You might not get the bang for the buck you had been hoping for here. It's not clear either strategy is 100% right. How much to bet on streaming versus the movieplex? Disney has devoted entire parts of its parks to Avatar. Netflix started cooperating with its rival Amazon to promote its film. In both cases, Hollywood cynics would say the real lesson here is not to choose one silo over the other, it's to not bet the farm in the first place. When the first Avatar came out, I'm realizing I was just getting out of college. I was debating whether to buy the new iPod Nano. Like, this is how long it takes to make a sequel these days? I thought we were in the future. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. ABC News, America's number one news source. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexis Christophorus. Today on ABC News Live, the dangerous holiday storm on the move, bringing blizzard conditions and potentially life-threatening bitter cold have a could impact your holiday plans. The Supreme Court stepping in on the situation at the border, preventing thousands of migrants from entering the country. This is Texas, sends hundreds of National Guardsmen to El Paso. Our team is there live. The January 6th committee urging the Justice Department to prosecute former President Trump for multiple crimes related to the attack on the Capitol. But the new evidence could mean for Trump as he runs for office again.
But we begin with that major winter storm set to sweep the country as we count down to Christmas. Some parts of the nation bracing for the coldest air in more than a decade. Let's get right to Cheryl Scott from our Chicago station WLS with the latest timing and tracking. Hi, Cheryl. Thanks, Alexis. As you know, we are tracking a powerful storm system. It's going to impact so many as we go into the Christmas holiday and pre-holiday travel. Really, you can see all of the winter alerts draped across more than half of the country, 28 states under a winter alert from winter storm warnings to winter storm watches all the way into the Midwest. The storm gets going out of the Pacific Northwest. We'll travel through the plains and then into the Midwest where we're looking at periods of very heavy snow and high gusty winds, even blizzard like conditions in the forecast here for the Northeast. It's going to be a whole lot of rain, but looking at these snow totals anywhere from about six to 12 inches for cities like Chicago up towards the UP Marquette and Michiana could see over 12 to 18 inches of snow. This is a big snowstorm and it's going to be accompanied by very gusty winds from the Midwest all the way to the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. These wind gusts here on Friday upwards of 50 to 60 miles per hour. These are definitely going to impact major airports from Philadelphia up towards New York and Boston. So definitely travel impacts will be felt for the Christmas holiday and then very cold conditions, bitterly cold air that's going to shift to the north and east for Christmas morning. It's going to feel like it's close to zero degrees. Alexis? Ouch, gonna be messy, Cheryl Scott, thank you. Meanwhile, emergency crews are responding after a powerful earthquake struck the northern coast of California early this morning, bringing at least a dozen aftershocks. The 6.4 magnitude quake knocking out power for thousands in Humboldt County. It comes just days after a 3.6 magnitude earthquake hit the San Francisco Bay Area. So far, no injuries have been reported. The Supreme Court has issued a temporary hold on ending Title 42. The Trump era policy barring asylum seekers from entering the U.S. because of COVID will continue, at least for now. This comes as Texas braces for a surge of migrants by sending hundreds of National Guard members to El Paso. Mireya Villarreal is in El Paso with the story. A temporary reprieve for Title 42. The Trump era health policy keeping asylum seekers from entering the country was set to expire Wednesday, but an administrative order coming from U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts pauses the case. Those people being removed from the country by using Title 42 and another immigration policy. Video provided to ABC News by Texas Congressman Tony Gonzalez appears to show overcrowding at a Border Patrol Run processing center in El Paso just a few days ago. This most recent surge overwhelming shelters like the Annunciation House. We've had very significant numbers of refugees that have been spending the night out on the street. 23-year-old Duliesca Altamira traveling here from Venezuela by herself and pregnant. She says there is a lot of violent corruption in their country. There was no place for them to work. Um, she had no other choice but to come here. All right, want to bring in ABC's Mireya Villarreal with more on this. So, Mireya, what does this administrative stay on Title 42 really mean for border cities dealing with this new surge of migrants? You know, really, this just puts a temporary pause on everything. We heard from the city officials last night. They basically said, you know, inevitably, Title 42 will go away. And so we've got to continue to plan for that. Um, we saw this morning, for example, Texas National Guard already rolling into town. They're here to help law enforcement. We also know that the Red Cross is working with city leaders to set up what they're calling a mega shelter that will have room for up to 10,000 people. So really, they are continuing to push forward because there is a good chance more migrants will continue to come. Well, that's my question. Will the migrants continue to come now that they realize there's a stay on, on Title 42? And have they even heard the news? You know, a lot of migrants that we've spoken to have told us they don't really know a whole lot about what Title 42 is about. Uh, they keep hearing it, you know, by word of mouth, but they're not watching the news, obviously. Um, for them, what they are being told in Mexico and in their home countries is now is the time to come. Now is your chance. And so that's what they're going off of right now. As far as what happens with Title 42, if it's put on pause, if it's not, that doesn't really kind of concern them. They're going to continue to come. They're going to continue to try and cross over. Um, and really, um, inevitably, they, they are going to try and, and continue to come and, and figure out what they can do here. All right, Mireya Villarreal, thank you. 
And immigration attorney and human rights advocate Benjamin Osorio joins us now for more on this border legal battle. So, Benjamin, what exactly does this administrative hold mean, and when do we expect a decision by the Supreme Court? I think they'll set this for oral argument. You'll get a decision on the merits and on the stay in a couple of months. Um, at the end of the day, I think Judge Sullivan's initial decision out of the D.C. District Court is going to be uh, held to be found correct because I believe it is an arbitrary and capricious application of Title 42 at the land ports of entry, but not at the airports of entry. So I think at some point, as everybody realizes, Title 42 will end. I think the bigger question is, you know, DHS is begging Congress to do something. DACA kids are begging Congress to do something. Asylum seekers are begging Congress to do something. And the U.S. public is begging Congress to do something. So the real question is, will Congress act to help alleviate this humanitarian crisis? So, Benjamin, advocates uh, challenging the administration in court say Title 42 violates federal and international law. What arguments are being made here? In terms of the people arguing against Title 42, you have Title 8, which clearly lays an ability for asylum seekers to seek asylum at a port of entry. Now, since they're not being allowed at the ports of entry, many people, because they fear for their lives in their home countries, are taking you know the desperate choice to cross the border. Um, and so, again, when we're not honoring our statutory and our treaty obligations, we are a signatory to the Refugee Convention and we're a signatory to the Convention Against Torture. When we're not honoring those obligations, then of course, you know, there's going to be different groups that are going to pursue action, legal action there to have Title 42 lifted. So under federal law, any non-citizen within the U.S. can make a claim for asylum. So who exactly is being removed under Title 42? They're allowing certain sex sections under Title 42, um, certain nationalities, certain language speaking. It hasn't been a consistent policy across the board. I think that is also one of the things that has been troublesome to advocates. And um, so, you know, I, I expect that we'll continue to see equal numbers of people try to seek asylum at the border as we have in the past. All right, Benjamin Osorio, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. President Trump is responding after the House January 6th committee voted to refer criminal charges against him to the Justice Department. The committee condemned Trump as a central cause of the attack on the Capitol, saying none of the events of January 6th would have happened without him. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the latest. It was a moment for history. Those in favor say aye. Aye. The January 6th committee wrapping up its 18-month investigation in dramatic fashion urging the Justice Department to prosecute Donald Trump for multiple crimes related to the attack on the U.S. Capitol. The committee brought forward new evidence even in its final hour. Never before seen testimony from Hope Hicks, one of Trump's longest serving and most loyal aides, who testified she told him she didn't see any evidence of voter fraud in the 2020 election. He said something along the lines of, you know, nobody will care about my legacy if I lose. Um, so that won't matter. Um, the only thing that matters is, is winning. The committee also referred to the Justice Department evidence of witness tampering, saying a lawyer who was being paid by a pro-Trump group told one witness she could claim she didn't recall certain facts, even if she did and even suggested she could get a well-paid job from a pro-Trump organization. We are concerned that these efforts may have been a strategy to prevent the committee from finding the truth. The committee summarized the most damning evidence against Trump, arguing that he knowingly lied about voter fraud, pressured state-level officials to manipulate election results, worked with allies to submit fake electors, and when all of that failed to overturn his election loss, whipped up his supporters into a frenzy to disrupt the transfer of power. As the mob ransacked the Capitol, some of them even chanting, hang Mike Pence, the committee says Trump stood by and did nothing. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. He is unfit for any office. 
The committee concluded the president committed at least four crimes, including obstructing an official proceeding, conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to make a false statement, and insurrection against the U.S. government. Donald Trump responded to the January 6th committee's action with a statement once again attacking the committee and insisting that all the investigations he has faced have only made him stronger. As for the Justice Department, no response yet. They, of course, will make their own decision about whether or not to prosecute Trump. Their investigation is well underway. Alexis? Jonathan Carl, thank you. ABC News legal contributor Kimberly Whaley joining me live now for more. So, Kim, the ball is in the Justice Department's court now, but the committee says they've given the Justice Department all the evidence they need to indict the former president. So what else will federal prosecutors consider? Well, they will do their own investigation, which they have been doing through the grand jury. And who knows if there's additional information that is coming through the grand jury, which is, of course, confidential, cannot be made public unless it, it ends up in some kind of criminal proceeding. Um, but they will pour over not just the eight volumes that are coming out this week, but all of the thousands of underlying um, witness statements and documents. And I just think in this moment, we should all feel pretty good about government having produced over 18 months, such an astonishing record of a moment in history that I think we all have to agree we don't want to see repeated. And I think that's really the bigger question for Americans. Not so much will Donald Trump go to jail, but what is in place in this moment to tamp down political violence around elections? Right, so we do not see this happen again in our country. Let's talk about this referred charge of insurrection. Uh, the 14th Amendment bars anyone convicted of taking part in an insurrection from holding public office. So how could the Justice Department navigate that while Trump is running for president in 2024? Yeah, that's a post-Civil War 